Modern Law Library listeners. I'm your host, Lee Rawls of the ABA Journal, and I'm very excited to share my interview with lawyer and bioethicist Katie Watson with you. But first, I have a little housekeeping announcement for you. I mentioned in my last episode that I have some exciting things to share that have been in development for a while. One of those exciting things is that as of this month, we're off our summer holidays and back to our twice a month schedule. Another bit of news is that I'm taking on a new position at the ABA Journal and will be in charge of running our web department. I'm still going to be the regular host for the Modern Law Library podcast because I adore our listeners and getting to chat with all our fascinating authors. But starting in October, the second episode each month will have a guest host. For example, in our next episode, you'll hear from the ABA Journal's Jason Tache speaking with Ed Walters about the book Data Driven Law. And that leads me to my last exciting announcement, which is that ABA publishing employees are going to start working with us on the Modern Law Library. If you're a longtime listener, you'll know that I try and feature a good mix of books and topics, but history and social policy are definitely my go-to subjects. ABA publishing has a lot of practice and technology-oriented books, and I hope that when they bring on their authors for that second episode of the month, It'll bring an added dimension to the kinds of books and topics you get to hear about on the Modern Law Library. I'd love to hear from any of my listeners with comments or suggestions for the future direction of the Modern Law Library. Have you read a good book lately? Tell me about it at books at abajournal.com. And now let's tune into our show where I'm speaking with Katie Watson of Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine about her book, Scarlet A the ethics, law, and politics of ordinary abortion. Katie Watson, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Right away, I was struck by your subtitle, The Ethics, Law, and Politics of Ordinary Abortion. Could you explain to our audience what you mean by ordinary abortion and, and why you think that that was a term that you needed to highlight you know, in the title of your book? Mm -hmm. It's a term I made up, um, and it's in response to my observation that the cases that we discuss the most in abortion, politics, and even in medicine sometimes, are the ones that occur the least. So on both, quote, sides of the abortion conversation, people want to highlight what they perceive to be the most sympathetic cases. So for those who oppose abortion rights, want to highlight abortions that are done later in pregnancy or particular methods that they find offensive. For those who support abortion rights, want to highlight cases of people who have been assaulted or people who have terrible anomalies, extreme youth, that sort of case. But really those cases, if you take both sets, maybe comprise 5% of all abortions. And in bioethics, generally, we have this Achilles heel of looking at what we call neon-like cases, because it's like, oh, someone wants to clone an eight-headed baby? Yes, we will talk about that all day. Oh, millions of people are not getting the diabetes care we already know how to deliver? Boring, right? That's called public health or policy, not an ethics issue, although it should be. And so what I was observing was that our rhetoric about abortion did not match the American experience of abortion. So I made up the term ordinary abortion to try to have a name for the other 95% of cases that we aren't discussing really in the philosophical literature or in the heated, fiery political rhetoric. Because of step one in bioethics is to get the facts, to understand mm -hmm. what is actually happening, to have an interesting and useful conversation about what ought to happen. And obviously, you know, you referenced bioethics. That's sort of your field. But can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about your background? Because you're not just involved in bioethics. Mm -hmm. You know, you you are a lawyer. Can you please tell us a little bit about your own background and, and what drove you to write this book? Sure. So my background is that I went to law school out of college at NYU, and I knew I wanted to do public interest law in some version of it. I clerked in the federal judiciary. I had uh, two or three jobs in public interest law and direct services in appellate litigation. And I still found that I was in love with this bioethics thing that I had discovered in law school. I had taken a seminar on bioethics and I had worked at Montfiore Hospital with their clinical ethicist in the obstetrics unit. And for me, bioethics was related to the early career epiphany I had, which was my interest was always bodies in the state. What can the government, whether it's sexuality or the death penalty, assisted suicide, abortion, 
what are the limitations of what the government can and can't do to control an individual citizen's body? And the epiphany I had was you can pass as many laws as you want or win as many cases as you please, but when the nice person in the white coat behind the closed door doesn't know what the patient's rights are or worse, doesn't care, that's really where power lies. And clinical medical ethics is about meeting people in that place of power. And when I went back to school and did a year-long fellowship at the University of Chicago in the McLean Center for Clinical Ethics, that was the training to sort of be at that bedside. And you're not on anybody's side. You're trying to figure out what would what is the spectrum of ethical options and how do the parties want to proceed. But you're there to balance power in the room. And it's not clear till you get in the room if there's a power imbalance and if so, on what side it might lie. So for me, that was a way to mix the direct services part of my soul with the sort of appellate and policy part of my soul, because then there's also this academic piece of thinking about, well, when we look at situations generally, how ought they to be? What might be missing? What could be better in this category of interactions or cases? And so it turned out that bioethics was a natural fit for me as a lawyer who's trained to think in terms of cases, but also as someone who has a scholarly bent and likes to think about policy and not just, you know, going on the same hamster wheel over and over again and systems and thinking about that, but also vulnerable populations and uh, making sure everybody's treated with dignity and gets the services that they need. And if you want to think about bodies, healthcare is the most compelling site to be. To talk about Scarlet A as a book. Now, my listeners who have been with me for a while, you know, we, we've addressed abortion mm-hmm. in the past and looked at various aspects of it. Generally, these were books focusing on individual cases and looking at the case law. But Scarlet A is not just looking at case law. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about what you were trying to accomplish with this book and the style choices you made in writing it? What Mm -hmm. made you write it in this way and what audience you're trying to reach? Sure. So I'm in a program and my second fellowship was in medical humanities, which is using the humanities and values-based social sciences to look at issues in medicine. And so I'm steeped in the world of the medical humanities and bioethics as well as constitutional law. Nowadays, it comes naturally to me to do what I think of as like a 360 review of a question or issue in medicine, to not just think how would a doctor think about it, although it's very important to understand that, but to say, how would a philosopher think about that? How might a historian think about that? Have we always done it this way or are there other ways to do it? How might a literature scholar think about this. What are the stories that are being told? What are the stories that are not being told? Who is telling them and why? How might a medical anthropologist think about it? How would a lawyer think about it? Looking at all these different disciplines and integrating them because life as lived is not in disciplinary categories, right? So law is one discipline, a super important one, but mm, lots of people are not going about their day thinking about, well, what's the law and what I'm about to do, right? And the law is also a reflection of our culture. It's both a culture driver and a culture mirror. So I wrote the book, I don't want to say without much thought, because it sounds like I just sat down and, you know, was in a fugue state and wrote a book. It's not quite like that. But the idea that it's incomplete to talk about abortion, just the law or just the medicine or just the cultural issues, or just the politics. Like I wanted to write a book that really tried to embrace life as lived and decisions as they are made, which is actually what I thought was missing from the debate. So the book is structured first with the epidemiology and the medicine of abortion, then narrative theory and thinking about storytelling, thinking about vocabulary, how we even speak to one another and hope to be understood on the topic, which is incredibly difficult and fraught compared to other topics. I wrote about the ethics and really delving into the philosophy literature, a chapter on the ethics of whether a person could ever have a, should ever have an abortion or be able to decide that. Then the ethics of when, since that's become very important in our national conversation about is there a time that's too late in pregnancy where that analysis changes? And then a chapter on politics, laws throughout So for me, it was just a desire to bring to bear academic content, methods, and data in a way that could be useful to a book club. 
<laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know, you talk about methods in, in academia, but I actually felt that this was a very accessibly written book. And I'd love for you to just read a passage to give our listeners just an idea of some of the language that you use and the writing style. Now, I picked this because I think it's very interesting when we talk about what words we use and what terms we want to assign to ourselves. Lawyers care very much about words. Mm -hmm. And so if you'd please read read this passage. I thought this was fascinating. I'm happy to. And thank you for the compliment. I want to say as the only lawyer teaching at a medical school, my whole job is to be translational, (laughs) right? To have sophisticated content that is never dumbed down, but is explained in a way that non-lawyers can understand it. So for me, I wanted to expand my classroom. And it's been a privilege to learn how to speak like this. Indulge me. If you think abortion should be legal one week into pregnancy, put your hand up. Now, if you think abortion should not be legal one week before full-term delivery, put that hand back down. If you didn't raise your hand at all, that means you think abortion should be illegal one week into pregnancy. If that's your view, now it's your turn. Please put your hand up. Now, do you think that a law banning abortion should include any exceptions? making abortion legal in cases of rape or incest or when a woman's life or health is threatened by the pregnancy or when the fetus has a serious anomaly or anything else you like. If yes, you think a general ban on abortion should have one or more exceptions, put that hand down. If your hand went up and down, you have a mixed position. If it moved in response to the first paragraph, you're pro-choice for women in early pregnancy and pro-fetal rights for women in late pregnancy. If it moved in response to the second paragraph, you're pro-choice for whatever women are described by the exceptions you chose, survivors of rape or incest, etc. You're not saying that they must get abortions, only that the choice is up to them. And pro-fetal rights for all other women. For people with mixed positions like these, the terms pro-life and pro-choice are inaccurate and incomplete. I've done this experiment with several lecture halls full of people, and if they turn out to be representative, mixed position would be the label for the vast majority of Americans. Yet in a 2015 Gallup poll asking Americans if they were pro-life or pro-choice, only 3% reported mixed position or neither. So to circle back, as you say in this passage, only 3% of people report that they have some sort of mixed position, and the rest of us appear to, you know, pick a side. Mm -hmm. But... Our conversations with each other and in society and in not just in courtrooms, but around the kitchen table. You said some statistics in the book that I also was a little bit surprised about. For instance, three in 10 American women who are 45 or older have had abortions. Mm -hmm. And looking forward, those of us who are 44 and younger were expected to have abortions at a rate of about one in four. Mm -hmm. But you know, you talk about ordinary abortions, and this is a very ordinary procedure for many people, but we don't have conversations about it. And one of the things I found interesting in this book is you try to find ways in which people can have conversations who hold very different views and start from a position where maybe it's possible to communicate and have common ground. Could you talk a little bit about your recommendations for people on either side of this Mm -hmm. issue to speak either to each other or to people who they think have opposing views. Where do you think those conversations need to start? Well, I think, and I don't want to presume what any individual is or isn't talking about or with whom, but I think it would be productive. My impression is more conversations with people you actually know and like. So let's start there. It's one thing to be like, I want to engage a stranger who has a very strong public expression of opinion. You can do that for sure. But like, do you actually know what your Uncle Harry thinks? Do you know what your niece thinks? Do you know what your best friend really thinks? Has it come up? Do you really talk about it? And even if you say we're both, quote, pro-life or we're both, quote, pro-choice, what does that actually mean to them? right? And so step one is I have a little grid in the book that I use with my students where I try to break out, okay, at the top of the axis is abortion, constitutional right, question mark, ethical act, question mark. And then on the other side of the axis, it's yes, no, right? So first of all, I think we've conflated the legal conversation with the ethical conversation. And I think that's been a 
hugely problematic thing. So if someone says, yes, abortion is a constitutional right, sometimes we assume that that means that they think abortion is always an ethical act, is ever an ethical act, right? But you have almost no idea what that person thinks about the ethics of abortion. They're just saying, yes, it's a constitutional right, or I agree with that constitutional analysis. On the no side, they might say, no, I don't see this privacy thing in the Constitution, but I think that it would be terrible for public health if abortion was illegal and I'd like to see it protected by statute, whatever. So there's the legal conversation. Similarly, there could be someone who says, as I just said, I don't see this privacy thing. I don't think it's constitutional right, but I don't think it's, I think it's terrible public policy to ban it, right? So we don't have very sophisticated law conversations in some ways. Then on the ethics conversation, someone could be completely opposed to abortion, but actually think it is a constitutional right or it ought to remain a constitutional right. I mean, not think it is, it is, but that it ought to remain a constitutional right. Like they wouldn't vote for a different constitutional amendment. So for example, I've had several people who who were pro describe themselves as pro-life, talk a lot about the preservation and the val- moral value and the personhood of embryos and fetuses. And it is only in my later development of my thinking, it has occurred to me to ask them, do you think abortion should be illegal? And I have been shocked at the number who have said, no, no, we can't make it illegal. And as I say in the book, my favorite pro-life doctor said in response to this question, he said, oh, I don't want abortion to be illegal. I want it to be unnecessary. And as another friend of mine who I quote in the book said, I genuinely wish no one would ever want or need an abortion. But I also think it's their decision. And of course, it has to be legal, right? And those are those are nuanced positions that, that separate law and ethics. Similarly, I have had a pro-choice, an obstetrician who has been very vocal about protecting abortion rights and how important it is for her patients and for our country and for women generally, say to me in confessional whispery tones, I mean, I don't know if it's ethical. I mean, after I had my kid, I just thought, gosh, I don't know about this. But I mean, it's got to be legal. And I had the sense that in that individual's very liberal circle, it was not possible to express concerns or doubts about the ethics of the procedure. But it hadn't shaken her strong pro-choice legal views. But that was like a taboo exchange or topic for her. So my recommendation is don't make assumptions. Break out the conversation. And that's a conversation about abortion opinion. The second thing I'd say, Lee, is we need to talk more about abortion experience. And people make an assumption that the person they're speaking with or that no one in the room has had an abortion, it's this very like abstract thing. Whereas if you were speaking about diabetes or cancer or car crashes or whatever, a sexual assault in certain rooms of a certain size or with certain individuals, you might think it's possible that someone here has been affected by the topic I'm talking about. But it's weird how in abortion we act like it's just this other, this abstract stranger that we're talking about. And so it's rare for people to disclose their private experiences. And and if there's a possibility of doing a little more of that, there is an analogy to sort of the coming out process of gay and lesbian and queer Americans saying like, oh, ding dong, you do know someone, you know, we can talk about this in the abstract all you want and that's important, but think about my face when you do it. Mm-hmm. Yet you and I are speaking on October 3rd and uh, listeners, I don't think that you'll be able to hear this episode before October 10th. So, you know, <laughs> just to ground you and where we are in the national conversation, the Supreme Court has been in the news both because the October term has just begun mm-hmm. and because the Kavanaugh case mm-hmm. is, uh, the Kavanaugh nomination is currently being considered. And, you know, we've had this conversation nationally about sexual harassment, sexual assault. Mm-hmm. And as I was reading the book, that was really pinging with me that you actually don't know when you are just speaking to someone what their personal experiences have been. So to transition and talk a little bit about the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. you know, it's a new term. There has been this concern that were Roe v. Wade to come before the Supreme Court in the next term, you know, all bets are off, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What do you see in both the current Supreme Court term or recent ones or cases that you think could come down the pike that you think will be kind of the next case we'll have to have a conversation about, a national conversation about what issues seem to be currently rising to the point where we would talk about it at the Supreme Court level? I don't, of course, have a crystal ball. I think that there could be a case that challenges Roe at a fundamental level. I think it's more likely that it 
will be a strategy of death by a thousand paper cuts. I'm not sure that Justice Roberts wants to see the headline row overturned. But in terms of access and practical ability, it may become, as I believe it's John Oliver called it, a theoretical right. You know, that idea that like, sure, you have a right to vote, except there's only one polling place in your state and you have to come three days in advance and la la la. And it's just sort of like, really, is that a right to vote? Uh, I don't think so. But there are some d e bans coming up the pike. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What um, a DNA is. Dilation and extraction. So there was uh, the controversy a decade ago about what opponents called uh, partial birth abortion and what physicians called intact dilation and extraction, D and X. And that procedure, the, the Supreme Court upheld that the federal government could ban this particular procedure, even though ACOG said that for some women it was safer, but they didn't need a health exception. The Supreme Court held only a life exception. And building on that, those who oppose abortion have now... The argument was like doing this in any intact way, and that was safer for women with bleeding disorders and other issues. That looked too much like infanticide was the argument, even though it's not a viable fetus, so it would die anyway. Someone could also say it looks like miscarriage, right? Because a fetus is leaving the uterus that is not viable, but it was characterized as looking like infanticide. And Now there's another wave of cases trying to say, well, you can't use the alternative method because it breaks up a fetus in the second trimester. And if you ban that procedure, you can't get a second trimester abortion, you know, banning all the ways that you can end fetal life and pregnancy. So I think that percolating up on the heels, not heels, it's been a uh, decade, but I think those are very important. The procedure bans, look like it's quote unquote small thing that's not at all. I also think this isn't in front of the, won't be, I don't know that this will be in front of the Supreme Court, but the the Title 10 regulations are very important to watch. And can you give me some examples of what a Title 10 regulation is? Oh, so excuse me. Um, the, the Title 10 program is the National Family Planning Program. And so the current HHS has proposed rules that would require further segregation. So no federal funds go to abortion. A Title X clinic is a clinic that can receive federal funds for contraception. So you can have a clinic like a Planned Parenthood or an independent clinic that gets federal money for contraceptive exams, counseling, actual physical, giving you contraception if you're below the poverty line, and also performs abortions with no federal money. They're proposing physical segregation, so you can't do those things at the same site. You would have to have two buildings and patients couldn't get the services in the same building. They couldn't get, if you're a Title X contraceptive clinic, you can't refer a patient to abortion. You can't say that abortion is an option if you're pregnant. So there's lots going on there in that rulemaking that is really devastating. So the Supreme Court is critical, but we shouldn't forget the power of other legislation. Lastly, I just want to say we focus on the Supreme Court and absolutely appropriately so, but there are 50 state courts and 50 state constitutions. And so, for example, this summer, Iowa, in considering a 72-hour waiting period in the case of Planned Parenthood versus Reynolds, not only rejected the 72-hour waiting period, saying social science and medical data show it doesn't change women's decisions and therefore it doesn't serve any benefit to patients. In the course of doing so, they found a fundamental right to abortion in the Iowa Constitution. And They'd said that the undue burden standard that the Casey case in 1992 applied, which has allowed this flood of regulations, is too low. A fundamental right is a fundamental right. So you need compelling state interest. You need least restrictive means. We're going to do strict scrutiny in Iowa. So that's amazing. So Rose overturned tomorrow. The women of Iowa, fine. In Illinois, our state legislature has passed a bill and the gov- our Republican governor signed it last year, HB 40, that not only supplies Medicaid funding for, quote, ordinary abortion, just all abortion, but it also changed our trigger language to trigger the other way that says, if Roe is overturned, the law of Illinois is this Roe standard. That's very interesting. So there's some hopeful, there's some things in the states that are important. Other states go the other way. Say if Roe's overturned, they've got trigger language that says all abortions are legal, you know, or fill in the blank. One other part about the book that I thought was, you know, very interesting. You highlight three Supreme Court cases, Roe v. Wade, 
Planned Parenthood v. Casey and Gonzalez v. Carhartt, but you use them as ways to talk about our cultural master plots is the term that you use. And mm-hmm. That's not master plot like, you know, people in a back room and a, <laughs> and a board full of red yarn uh, connecting things. And the three master plots that mm-hmm. you outlined are, we say, oh, abortion is always a difficult decision. Abortion is a woman's issue. And abortion is about sex. And in your research for the book, you seem to have come up with these these you know three messages, but also a lot of evidence that this is too simplistic. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So master plot is the term that literary scholars use to talk about the bare bones, the skeleton of a story, of a plot that gets dressed up in different storylines, but then deployed over and over in a culture. So the little engine that could and Horatio Alger stories, you know, are very different. Children's book about a train and then depression era stories about a young man who bootstraps his way up. But the master plot, the, the inside each is hard work rewarded with success, right? And so what I felt like there were all these cultural messages and partly that the Supreme Court is both reflecting and then also enforcing or creating, right? I mean, it's an iterative process that I was hearing. But then as I became, I learned more about the social science data about abortion patients and their decisions and their experiences. And as I did my own analysis, I started to think like, hey, these are again out of sync and learning about master plots and then the other voices, which are called counter narratives is important because it makes you realize sometimes it's abortion storytelling that is disguising what's really abortion opinion. So like abortion is always a difficult decision, sounds like a description of like a group of stories of people's experiences. When you look at the social science data of people who have abortions, who are telling you whether or not it was a difficult decision, what you come to understand is that's actually abortion opinion, which is abortion ought to always be a difficult decision. But women who have abortions, some report that it was very easy decision. Some report it was somewhat easy. Some report it was neither easy nor difficult. So the abortion is a difficult decision didn't resonate in terms of some of the women I had spoken to about their decisions. And I'm not a social science researcher. I wasn't doing data collection in this way. I was reading existing literature and then talking to some women who were representative of data that I was reading about. But it was so interesting to me that one study talked about, or asked women, I should say, about how much difficulty they had in deciding to seek an abortion. And what fascinated me was 13% said their abortion decision was very easy, 18% somewhat easy, 15% neither easy nor difficult, 27% somewhat difficult, and 27% very difficult. And to me, it was like, oh, right. Experiences on a spectrum. Everybody's got different things going on that could make a decision difficult. It doesn't mean they were excited about it or cavalier about it. To say a decision is easy is to say it was obvious or clear that this is what I ought to do or what I want to do. We have this image, and I quote Justice White's dissent in Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton, where he talks about this idea of this cavalier, casual woman who has an abortion for her convenience. And he uses the word convenience over and over and over in two and a half pages. And what I say in the book is here's the counter narrative of these women. They don't sound like they're being casual or cavalier. They sound really confident. They sound very clear in their values. They know who they are. They know where they are in their life. And they are confident in their decision. Similarly, I have friends who've become pregnant unexpectedly and we're very clear, I'm having this baby. But we don't call them casual or cavalier because that's the unexpected course, right? So the master plot idea, the idea that um, abortion is about sex, when 59% of abortion patients already have children, I think it's 88% are in romantic relationships a huge percentage have been with their boyfriend or live-in partner or husband for over a year. So it seems like these are couples issues and family issues, but we always look at the woman in isolation. Now that's appropriate legally. Abortion is a woman's right, an individual right must remain. But socially, 
It's often an issue of romance. It's often an issue of couples. It's often an issue of families. But we've allowed the legal rhetoric to determine our personal and our political rhetoric. And that that is not necessarily reflective of reality. And that reminds me, you know, as you're writing this book, you had to make a decision as an author. Mm -hmm. The epilogue of this book describes an experience that you yourself had in the process of researching this book. Could you talk a little bit about both the epilogue and and what it contains and what made you decide to write about your own personal experience? It was a very difficult decision in some ways. In another way, again, it was, I should put it on my very easy continuum, you know, of those researchers. It was like in some ways an easy decision in the sense that I, in my heart, I knew what I needed to do but it wasn't one that I came to, I didn't come to it easily, if that makes sense, or it didn't sit easily. But while I was writing this book, I was also wanting to become pregnant. And my husband and I became pregnant and we had a medical issue. And then later I became pregnant again and we had our child. And as I was writing the book, you know, it's funny, I always felt, and I'm very clear about this in the book, that the constitutional right to abortion would that Roe v. Wade was correctly decided. And it's not negotiable as I say in the book, it's not negotiable to me. The ethics of abortion, I will talk to you all day about, because I think there's just room for a lot of interesting opinion and thinking on that. But in terms of freedom and rights, I, I feel very firmly about that. When I became pregnant with my child and delivered my child and nurtured my child, it just reinforced my feeling of what if the government forced you to do that and you didn't want to? what would that be like? Like, that's that's amazing. Um, so it really, it both deepened my compassion and respect for those who feel like abortion is unethical. And that if you just think about how pregnancy ends, if uninterrupted, how could you disrupt that? And it also reinforced my feeling that this absolutely must remain a constitutional right. It's interesting that nurturing and delivering my child and then nurturing him as an infant and a small person is what has affected my thinking most. However, before I had him, I had a pregnancy that had medical, that we had a medical issue and we had a decision to make about whether to go forward with that pregnancy. And we ended up choosing to end that pregnancy, that very wanted pregnancy. And so it was surreal to be almost at the end of a writing a book about abortion and having heard so many other people's stories and read so much of the literature and then to be sitting in a clinic myself And it certainly wasn't the book I proposed, uh, the epilogue. I didn't propose an epilogue. So I think I want to be very clear that no one writing about any particular issue has any responsibility, as an academic, any responsibility to share personal details about anything. Pediatrician doesn't need to tell you whether they have kids and an oncologist doesn't need to tell you whether they had breast cancer. I, you know, maybe it's relevant, maybe it's not, it's up to them. But for me, I felt like the claim of medical privacy was an entitlement that cost other people too much. And here in this book, I'm talking about how silence around abortion has allowed abortion patients, that one in three or one in four, to be so stigmatized. And the physicians, we haven't talked about, I work with physicians who who provide abortions and how much water they carry, how some of them are targeted and they've become the face of the right because they they make it possible. It's the kind of right you need someone else to typically to do with you, although we have now opportunities for self-induced abortion, but most people want to go to a professional. And in other areas of medicine, you have patients and grateful families, you know, raising money and uh, supporting the institutions. And here you have exactly the opposite. You know, you have this thing that a third to 25% of all women will do, but they're all hiding. Most of them are hiding and letting the doctors go out on a limb. And I just think that's fundamentally unfair. And I think it's unsustainable. So I felt a moral obligation to share the story I was surprised to have. And I felt a sense of solidarity with the women I had interviewed and every woman who had participated in a research study and shared something about their lives to stand next to them and uh, say, yeah, I get it. Well, Katie, thank you so much for coming in to speak with us. For my listeners, again, the book is Scarlet A, The Ethics, Law, and Politics of Ordinary Abortion by Katie Watson. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, 
review and subscribe in Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast listening service.